This is Mark Jeske being interviewed by Pat Kenny at uh, Mesquite, Nevada on October 4th, 2013 at 1400. The purpose of this interview is to collect information on squadron members as part of the Purple Fox HMM 364 Squadron Oral History Project. Well, I'm Mark Jeske and uh, I'm born and raised on the south side of Chicago. Um, family moved us out to the south suburbs of Chicago just prior to my starting high school and uh, so spent my formative years in the uh, creative laboratory called the South Side. Um, enjoyed what I did, was a, uh, was a moderate student in high school. Um, knew when I graduated high school, um, I was 17 when I graduated in May of 68 and uh, turned 18 on September 24th and enlisted in the Marine Corps that same day. <clears throat> Got into a 30-day wait program and uh, had a recruiter that uh, basically took me right down the path all the way into four years with the Marine Corps. So I uh, originally thought I'd do two years and he said, well, gee, Jeske, you scored so well on your tests. You know, I can guarantee you aviation if you want to do four years. And I thought, oh, gosh, sign me up for that. Flying sounds better than crawling, so away I went. And uh, so I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Um, did my physical in downtown Chicago, which was a real treat with all the other local convicts that were headed off to the service. And uh, so I wound up going to San Diego, uh, where I did my boot camp. Um, then Pendleton came out of there as a... PFC and then went to Memphis. Um, actually uh, started out in jet school and was going to go to an F-4 Phantom Squadron on J-79 engines and so uh, graduated top of my class and <clears throat> uh, again a, a sharp talking uh, staff sergeant said well you know you do really well in helicopters and I thought oh sign me up for that too. I hadn't heard about that don't volunteer for stuff but uh, you know, it went really well, so went through helicopter school in Millington, Tennessee, and uh, then got sent out to uh, New River and went to HMM 261. As soon as I got to HMM 261, went right on a Caribbean cruise, and uh, as soon as I came off the Caribbean cruise, had a 30-day leave and went straight to Vietnam from there. So it was, uh, it was quite a fast trip to, to Vietnam, but enjoyed it had some really good friends and the first time that I heard of the Purple Foxes was when I was part of 261. We had, had some sergeants come back and they were, had all been crew chiefs with the Purple Foxes and uh, it was interesting to me how revered they were as crew chiefs and how proud they were of their organization. And I thought, well, if I'm going to go to Vietnam, that'd be a great place to be. And so turned out my orders were for the Purple Foxes and there I was. So, but, uh, you know, I had a good 30-day leave before I went over there, and uh, one of the crew chiefs uh, who went with me um, had been in the same squad, and actually we'd gone to boot camp together. His name was Chuck Ivey. <clears throat> he wound up going to the Flying Tigers. I went to the Purple Foxes, and uh, another crew chief, Randy Breeding, who uh, was a great friend of mine, um, very competitive with each other, and so that continued forever. Um, you know, we had uh, we had a pretty good cast of characters over there, and so it uh, it was a it was a pretty good time actually. So Jim Buckland and uh, Gary Radliff and uh, just a bunch of guys we were there with. I'd uh, I'd go back and do it all over again with them. So, but uh, you know, it was a it was an interesting transition into the Marine Corps for me. Um, I have an uncle. His name is Joe Hunt, and he was a colonel in the Marine Corps. Um, and so I had spent a little bit of time with him. He was the commanding officer of Henderson Hall and all the Marine Embassy security guards. And so I had uh, I'd been around him a few times and been on and off Marine Corps bases. And uh, of course, when you're the commanding officer's nephew, you get treated pretty well when you're on a Marine Corps base. So that was impressive to me. Um, you know, but there was just something different about the Marine Corps. And uh, then my sister married a Marine. He was uh, a communications uh, corporal. In fact, uh, he had been at Quezon, and then when he came home from Quezon, he went to El Toro Marine Base. So I visited him out at El Toro, which was a pretty interesting experience as well, too. So I'd seen Marine Corps aviation and really happy about what I was doing. But, 
you know, Vietnam was, uh, um, it was quite an experience. I remember very vividly the first night that I got there, you know, when we landed in Da Nang, it was the middle of the night. <clears throat> I could hear, um, you know, the uh, rounds that were impacting out in the, the mountains, and so I climbed up on top of the Air Force barracks and sat up on the roof and just watched the uh, gun flashes going off out in the mountains, and I thought that was pretty interesting. But uh, went to HMM 364 the following day, checked in, and uh, they welcomed me and showed me where my new aircraft was at, and it was actually a revetment queen at that point. Um, it was YK-9, and the previous YK-9 had crashed. Uh, this one was sitting in uh, the revetments and had been cannibalized. And so they said, well, here's your bird, put it back together and go from there. So it took me about a week to scavenge parts, and I scavenged them from everywhere. Um, and I quickly learned that um, there were willing squadrons across the runway to donate parts to me in the middle of the night. So it worked out pretty good. I'd go visit the Flying Tigers or one of the other 46 squadrons, and if I needed a part and we didn't have it, I simply commandeered it from one of theirs. So it worked out pretty well. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was a transition time for 364. Uh, commanding officers had been changing. Colonel Stedman had took over. Um, and, uh, you know, I really respected Stedman. Um, we had a lot of really good pilots in 364, and we had some really outstanding crew chiefs as well, too. And uh, then we got Sergeant Major Rapold into uh, the squadron. And for some reason, he really took a liking to Randy Breeding. Um, and Randy was a sergeant already, and I was still a lowly corporal. And uh, by the way, I did figure out how Randy became a sergeant when he checked in when he went over to Paraloft, there was a clipboard laying there with um, a sign-up sheet for whoever ran Paraloft to recommend any people for promotion to sergeant. Nobody was in there, so Randy just wrote his name on there. We couldn't figure out how Randy had made sergeant so quick, <clears throat> and so then that turned into a big competition later. So, But uh, anyhow, he did. He made sergeant. and. Uh, you know, Sergeant Major Rapold had taken over. He liked Randy. Really, didn't care for me too much. Um, and I had uh, probably brought that on myself. Um, my uncle, who I mentioned before, back then was the G2 officer at Red Beach for all of I Corps. So I could go visit him every once in a while. And if I had any time off, if I wasn't flying, I'd hop a ride over to Red Beach and go have lunch with him. And uh, one day he turned the tables, and just as we were coming back in off of a flight, we had been in the fuel pits, and we were summoned back to the flight line as quickly as we could get there. And as we taxied in and I got out, I was still on my long court, and we were shutting down the aircraft. And here comes my uncle, who is a full bird colonel, and Sergeant Major Rapold hot on his heels. And uh, I think I took my helmet off and said, Jesus, it's about time you got here. It took you long enough. And I thought Sergeant Major Rapold was about to pass out right there on the flight line. He thought, oh my God, who is this person talking to this colonel this way? So he didn't appreciate that I hadn't informed him that I had a relative who was you know, at least a pretty decent ranking officer at that point. So he just didn't appreciate it too much. But, uh, you know, uh, the time in Vietnam um, was an interesting time. Probably, I think, the coldest and wettest I've ever been. Uh, was while that while we had the monsoon season there, um, and like everybody else, we just uh, you know took our boots off at night and dried them out as much as possible and put them back on in the morning and went flying again, and that was it. But uh, you know I had a good aircraft back then. It uh, seemed like it always had good power when we needed it. Uh, didn't have a beat in the rotor heads, and the pilots appreciated that, and so did I, quite honestly. Um, you know, and we flew some really good missions over there, so just, uh, just enjoyed the entire process, quite honestly. So, but I think it was the guys that I, I really worked with every day. What kind of missions did you fly? Oh, heavens. Um, we did a little bit of everything. Um, first mission I ever flew over there was to go out and pick up Marines who had been, uh, killed the day before in a battle. And so that was my very first load, was to pick up uh, a few Marines that had died the day before. 
Um, flew a lot of medevacs, flew out to, I think it was Sanctuary back then, Sanctuary Repose, I can't remember which one, but uh, made a few trips out to, you know, the hospital ship. Um, did a lot of recon inserts and recon extracts, um, which were always exciting. Those were, uh, you know, everybody, uh, the hair on the back of your neck stood up as soon as you knew you were going on one, and especially when it was a call to get them out of wherever they were. Uh, but we did a lot of uh, troop inserts, extracts, a lot of external cargo slinging. Uh, we just went all over the place. And so, um, again, you know, it really filled up your day. You, you launched early in the morning, you came back late at night. And uh, I don't think for the entire time that I was at Marble Mountain, I ever made it to the mess hall when it was open. I pretty much lived on the 1940s issue Sea Rats. And uh, we have a... a girl by the name of Missy ran the cage in uh, the hangar, and she'd bring in rice bread, and so I'd get a can of chicken noodle soup and some rice bread, and, you know, when it was time to have a little lunch, I'd stick the chicken noodle soup up there by the engine exhaust and uh, warm it up, and hopefully get it back out of there in time before it opened up by itself, but I uh, made that mistake a couple times. Um, yeah, but that's pretty much the way we lived over there, so... Do you, do you remember any of the names of the places that you used to fly into? Oh, gosh. Um, there was Ross and Baldy, and uh, actually, I forget who I was with, but we revisited Quezon one day. Uh, we went to Hue. We went, uh, uh, gosh, we were just all over the place, it seems. But there was one really nice duty that we had. Wherever the general's headquarters was at, he lived up on a hill, and it was always great duty to go there because you'd always get a decent breakfast out of the deal. So that was a pretty good duty day. But uh, gosh, I, I think we hit just about all the places out there. Any uh, missions that stand out to you in your head as being severe? <clears throat> um, I think the mission that I, I flew with uh, Mike Tennant, um, you know, Mike got his Distinguished Flying Cross out of that mission, and I got a single Mission Air Medal, but uh, there had been a recon team that had been pinned down on top of a hill and uh, pinned down pretty severely. And so uh, we came in there with an OV-10 and a couple of Huey gun, and a couple of Cobra gunships back then, um, and uh, pulled them out of the hill. And that was a pretty exciting day because all the way down we had uh, the 50s firing out of each side and uh, trying to keep everybody's head down and. Uh, you know, there was a lot going on in that zone that day. So, but it was good to get in, and it was just as good to get out. So, any uh, missions that uh, reminded you of uh, severe humor? Um, not so much from a. I don't remember a lot of humorous missions. Um, you know, but I, there were some pretty that were pretty impactful to me. Um, I don't think I'll ever forget the uh, Christmas 1970 missions uh, when we flew chow and ice cream out to the troops in the field. Um, I don't think I've ever seen so many um, or such intensely grateful people uh, to be remembered at Christmas time. Um, when we delivered hot chow to, to the Marines on the hilltops um, as a crew chief, um, you know, they just hugged you, grabbed you. Um, it was hard to get off the ground and get back into the, the helicopter on some of the hilltops because uh, they just didn't want to let go of you. And uh, so that was a pretty good day. I remember, uh, I think it was Mark Bum <clears throat> that I flew with and uh, maybe um, Steve Cux. But that was a pretty big day and uh, had a lot of meaning, still does to me today. So. What did you do uh, after you left 364? Um, after I left 364, I went to uh, Flying Tigers across the runway and flew with them until um, they were decommissioned as well. And uh, that was an interesting process because um, I had been I had gotten a combat promotion to sergeant uh, from Colonel Stedman. I was actually um, I was the helicopter that went in and picked up Colonel Stedman from his crash. And uh, so I had Colonel Stedman in the back of the helicopter. Um, as any good crew chief, I took a bunch of oily rags and gave them to him for a bandage for his head. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it was just a, that was a different kind of a day. But I went to 262, 
um, we shut down the squadron, put us on the Iwo Jima, and we sailed on the Iwo Jima back to Pearl Harbor. The rest, the rest of the squadron had gone ahead. And so coming into Pearl Harbor was a, a pretty moving experience. But uh, after uh, 262, we went to Kaneohe. I was there for a couple of months. And then uh, I got orders to go back to the U.S. and um, went to HMX-1. So I went to uh, HMX-1 and I got into the presidential helicopters and uh, actually had the first 46 that was painted a dark green with a white top. Um, I remember the day we sent it off and got it back and uh, had an interior package in it that was for the VIPs. Uh, but HMX-1 was pretty interesting duty as well, too. So. Any good stories about HMX-1? Oh gosh, never trust a Secret Service agent. <laughs> um, you know, actually with HMX-1, um, one night I, I lived out in Woodbridge and uh, I had the uh, staff NCO duty that night, so I was the sergeant in the barracks and um, there were probably about two o'clock in the morning, there were about a dozen men that showed up and they were, some of them were in suits, some of them um, were military uniforms and they wanted to know where a young corporal was at. So I had to look on the board to see where he slept. And uh, they said, well, take us to his uh, cube. And so I did, I took him down a flight of stairs and walked through the squad bay. And, and here was this young corporal sound asleep and literally they snatched him out of bed and uh, literally took all the gear that he had in his cube with him, and he disappeared in the middle of the night. And evidently, the story that I heard later on was that he had been in some bar up in Georgetown, had told somebody sitting next to him that he had been a, a guard for the Marine Corps helicopters, and uh, you know made some other derogatory comment towards the president. And uh, so they snatched him right up and never saw that boy again. So it was an interesting little night, so I thought, Good thing to keep your mouth shut around here. So, so how many years did you do in the Marine Corps before you got out? I did four years in the Marine Corps and uh, then stayed out for about a year and or two years, and then I went back to join the reserves. And I was with a Huey squadron up at Glenview Naval Air Station outside of Chicago, which was uh, that was a really interesting place as well too because these were vintage Hueys back then and so here was this 46 guy in a Huey squadron and had no idea what to do with a tail rotor. So it's been a little different. But uh, you know, one of the things that I did find, um, when Colonel Stedman had crashed, one of the gunners on his plane was a fellow by the name of Lawrence Taylor. And uh, when we picked up Taylor and Colonel Stedman, his um, face shield, um, his visor had shattered into his face and so he had uh, shards of, of broken sh uh, shield in his face um, really cut up pretty bad and he was trying to to pat the blood that was coming out and just making it worse and so I eventually I thought this kid's really going to be scarred up but I saw him when I was in the reserves he showed up at Glenview one day he was passing through on another flight and saw him and he actually looked pretty good had a lot of scars on his face but he looked pretty good and so it was it was nice to see him again so that was the last time I ever saw him. So did you stay in the reserves for a long time? Or? No, actually I only stayed in the reserves for a year. And at that time I was living back in Chicago, working in downtown Chicago. Um, we were coming up on our second two-week um, time away, our active time. And they were going to send the Huey Squadron to upstate New York for cold weather training. And I thought, that's just not something that really intrigues me is to go freeze my keister off up in upstate New York. So at that point, I decided to, to get out of the reserves, and so I stayed out at that point. So, and what did you do in civilian life? Um, well, I worked a number of different jobs. Um, I actually went to, to Tennessee for a few years and worked uh, with Randy Breeding um, and uh, worked on a breeding farm, uh, which raised cattle. Um, I eventually got into human resources. I worked for a couple really nice corporations, GTE Corporation, SHL System House, um, home to my skills. And so I've been a vice president of human resources now for probably the past close to 20 years. So, and today I specialize in helping small companies do mergers and acquisitions. And um, hopefully I'll just go a couple more years and be done with it all. So it'll be the third time I retire. 
anything that uh, you want to add to this video that uh, was significant and you want your family to be able to keep as a memory any of your memories that you want to that you might not have talked about yet um i think from uh, just the marine corps side um the marine corps was probably the most influential time in my life um and it really shaped me as uh, the person that I am today. Um, the discipline that's taught, the structure that's taught, the uh, you know the the pull it together and find a solution um, orientation that the Marine Corps has has done me extremely well throughout my career. Um, I've tried to live by those values as well, and uh, you know there is. Uh, I don't think there's ever a day that I that I doubt that that wasn't one of the best decisions of my life to go in the Marine Corps. Um, even though a lot of people said don't do it, um, for me it was exactly what I needed and has done me extremely well over all these years. Sounds like you had a great relationship with Randy Breeding that continued all the way, <laughs> all the way through. And uh, so, uh, what uh, what was his special quality that that kept you guys together like that? What was it? You like so much about that. Well, we were such total opposites. I mean, I was a kid from the south side of Chicago, um, had never seen a farm in my life. Randy was a farm boy, had never seen a city in his life. And so uh, we kidded each other a lot. Um, we fought with each other a lot. Uh, but, but we enjoyed each other's company quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I got to know Randy and his family. Uh, Randy was stationed in Washington, D.C. as well, at Quantico with me when I was at HMX1. He was across uh, with, I think it was 262 back then. Um, and so Randy and I started on the weekends jumping in the car and swooping down to his farm in Tennessee. And then we'd race back on, you know, early Monday morning to get back into squadron. Um, you know, but I, I really, uh, I liked Randy's family. I, I liked their values. I liked what they did. And for me, to be on a farm was very, very different. And so, uh, you know, this, this city kid that had grown up in the steel mills, um, all of a sudden is in the middle of nowhere on a farm, you know, chasing cows around. It's, uh, it's a little different. But Randy and I always got along well and uh, watched over each other. Uh, we competed in everything. If Randy got crew chief for the month, then by God, I was going to win it the next month. And so that's exactly how it played out. And it killed me that he made sergeant before I did. Of course, I didn't find out for 20 years how he made it. Um, so that was, that was uh, I felt better after that whole process. Did the politics of the Vietnam War bother you at all when you got home or anything like that? Um, it didn't so much bother me. Um, I pretty much stayed out of the politics. Um, there were a few nauseating people who wanted to throw it in your face every once in a while. Um, but I pretty much ignored them as much as I could. Um, you know, when I came home and went through San Francisco, you know, I got harassed a little bit you know, while I was waiting for a flight home. Um, I'd stopped at one of the, the hotels I had an overnight in San Francisco. And there were some guys there that had seen my uniform, and, you know, they were just, uh, they were general idiots that just harassed you a little bit. But, you know, once you stood up and confronted them, they pretty much shut up. So... But it was like that for a few years. Um, I'm really glad to see the way they treat the veterans today. So, world of difference between them, and uh, you know, thank God it is different for them.